So everyone, I think it's the time. So let's start our webinar today. And uh, good morning and welcome to, to join our, I saw some, I'm sorry, I saw her messages. Good morning and thank you very much to join our UFTI webinar. Today's topic is, uh, is about modern data-driven science for sustainability and resilience. We will have speakers, three speakers to give us the perspectives from Dallas Fort Worth International Airport and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Uh, this webinar uh, was initiated by our resilience and sustainability group, especially uh, from Dr. Stanley Ruth. And she and I will uh, moderate this webinar together. Um, before that, uh, please give me a few minutes uh, to briefly introduce our resilience and the sustainability group. Uh, this group was formed in late 2019 and with the mission to promote multidisciplinary collaboration and uh, exploring cross-cutting uh, cross research uh, with a particular focus on the resilience and the sustainability issues in transportation system. We hope we can integrate efforts and results for educating the next generation of leaders and, sorry, sorry for the, mm, uh, for the next generation and the professionals. And uh, this group seeks to um, gathering collective efforts to do the research in two tracks, just as the name of the group. The first one is resilience, um, we are interested in both natural disaster and the extreme events, such as hurricanes, sea level rise, pandemic, and so on. We are also interested in sustainability related issues, in particularly the topic covered electric vehicle renewable energy, vice, uh, vehicle, in, vehicle emissions, and so on. And currently the group have 15 members and um, those members uh, involve very diverse expertise, expertise from transportation, coastal engineering, environmental electrical engineering, and uh, mechanical en engineering, and so on. And our members have successfully secured research uh, projects for this topic from NSF, um, UTC, uh, Florida Sea Ground, uh, National Hazard Center, FDOT, and so on. If you're interested in the members and the projects has happened in this group, and you can visit our website. At the bottom of the slides, I provide the parts, um, obviously the navigation uh, for you to approach our group website and also provide the link for the group website. With that, and, uh, let me move to our first speaker, okay? Our first speaker is um, Mr. Robert Houghton, and he is Vice President, Vice President of Environmental Air, uh, Affairs for Dallas Fort Worth International Airport. And he served as the airport board's environmental and sustainability officer. officer. He provides strategic and innovative leadership for DFW airports, environmental and sustainability programs, his leadership has resulted in several key domestic and global awards for the airport. And uh, I'm not going to list all of them, and it's just to mention the most recent two one. In 2019, they got the EPA's Green Power Leadership Award. And in the same year, they, um, they are the first North American airport to be recognized by the United Nations Climate Neutral Now programs. And Mr. Houghton also creates, participates, and leads many business and the team initiatives in this area. For example, he manages and directs the DFW's North compatibility programs, working with FAA, other airports, and those affected by changes in the air traffic procedures. He earned his bachelor degree and a master degree in agriculture and biological engineering from 
from Uni University of Florida, um, or your Peter. <laughs> so in 2019, he received the Distinguished uh, Alumnus Award from the University of Florida. Welcome, Mr. Houghton. Okay. And uh, our next speaker is Mr. Caleb uh, Phillips. And he is a data scientist with the Compute Computational Science Center at NREL. He got his PhD in computer science from University of Colorado. Oh, Colorado sorry. Uh, his research interests include advanced and alternative fuel vehicle technologies, transportation systems, material science, strategic energy analysis, wind power, and, uh, and so on. And uh, thank you very much for giving us the talk. Um, you know, very soon. And uh, our third um, speaker is Miss Miss Sherry Stark. She is the engineering in Integrated Applications Center at NREL. She got her master's degree in Environmental and Sustainability Engineering from University of Colorado, Denver. Uh, Sherry's work primarily focuses on resilience. That, and they include the great integration of distributed the renewable generation, energy, water, nexus issues, and the interconnection processes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Welcome and uh, look forward to see your talk. And so um, please warmly welcome all these three speakers to give us their talk. And I believe they will give us a wonderful view about the resilience and the sustainability in airport uh, area. And uh, after the presentation, um, Dr. Stenner is going to moderate the Q&A uh, process. And during the presentation, if you have a question, you're welcome to uh, put your question in the chat box. And um, you know, uh, the, if the speaker have time, they may respond or, or they will respond during the Q&A period. Uh, thank you very much. And I will leave the rest of time to our speakers and uh, that uh, Mr. Houghton start to share his slides. Okay. Can you all see my, slides, okay. my deck? Okay, great. Well, thank you, Dr. Du, Dr. Steiner. Thank you for inviting us. Um, I think the topics of- uh, Mr. Sustain Houghton, you probably uh, mute yourself. We cannot hear you. Oh, I can hear you fine, Robert. Okay. I can hear you fine. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Dr. Du, Dr. Steiner. Thank you for inviting us. Um, uh, the topics of sustainability and resilience are very relevant today to all of us. Um, we've seen some significant events happen that have uh, elevated the importance of, of these topics. And um, hopefully uh, it's great to join um, this session and to share some of the work we're doing at the airport. and. Hopefully you'll get a, a glimpse into some of the amazing resources that the National Renewable Energy Lab has, not only in terms of the scientists there, but they have some incredible research tools that they're using to help us solve some very significant problems. So before I go into that though, I'd like to share a little bit of my background. Um, starting with, uh, the shaping forces that inspired me. Hang on a second. We did lose your slides, Robert. Just I know. Yeah, I'm having issues with uh, my slides. No worries.
Do you do you have some problem? Yes, I'm having some problems with my my slides. They're stuck. Okay. Take your time. I think maybe close and then reopen it. My apologies, so. No worries, no worries. Yeah, I'm having problems getting the slides to advance. Are you able to close it and then reopen it? That's what I'm trying to do. Okay. Is it possible you can send your slides to one of us or your your other speakers so then we can leave the slides for you? Um, I, sh I should get it to work now. Hang on okay. a second. Well, it looks like we had a, a couple people show up just now, so they'll be excited to learn they didn't miss anything. So. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, let's try this one more time. My apologies again. Uh, no worries, it happens. Can you all see this? Yeah, yeah, I can okay. see it. Great, sorry about that. Well, um, let me just jump right into it. Um, just a little bit about my background. Uh, I was born in Guyana in South America. Uh, it's an amazing country, beautiful, spectacular waterfalls. This is the largest single drop waterfall in the world. Uh, and you can see beautiful ecosystems. All of the exposure to that really helped me to connect with nature and the environment and develop a deep appreciation for that. Uh, this is another view of that waterfall. When my family and I left, however, um, one of the lasting memories I had was the the devastation of some of the natural habitat, uh, which was cleared for uh, exploration of bauxite, which is used for alumina, manufacture of alumina. One of the other um, uh, aspects in my, once we moved to the US, I joined the Marine Corps, served in the first Gulf War, and got an exposure to some of the major events that were happening in, in the world, like the, the burning oil wells that contributed a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, pollution into the environment, uh, creating long and short term, short and long term consequences, both on people and the environment. And so that was actually a trigger point in my life that uh, caused me to inspired my desire to do, uh, do something to help improve conditions in our world. Uh, and that led to my tenure at the airport today. So just a little bit of background on the airport, you know, the airport is bigger than the island of Manhattan. Uh, as you can see on the top right, the infrastructure is pretty e expansive. We have almost 1,300 lane miles of roadway, 133 bridges uh, on the land side, and over 75 million square feet of pavement on the air side. Uh, we're owned by the cities, jointly owned by the cities of Dallas and Fort Worth. And as Dr. Du mentioned, we were proud to be the first carbon neutral airport in North America. Uh, but how did we get here? In 1974, when the airport opened, there were four terminals and three runways. Um, and over the years, it expanded in response to the growth of our region. And 
uh, in the last few years, our region was listed as the fastest growing metro area in the world. Um, also, a little bit uh, more of the role an airport plays in a community. We help to connect people and goods across the globe. And no, it was the importance of that role was no more evident than last year at the onset of the pandemic when our passenger volumes dropped by 90%. Um, the airlines quickly shifted to moving P uh, freight around the world, critical medical supplies and PPE in support of the recovery effort. But a lot of that growth can come at a consequence, right? And so if you look at this, this shows the encroachment from the surrounding community based on the setting of the airport. Over the years, a lot of the natural habitat has been displaced in lieu of development. And as a result, there are many uh, consequences that we are managing to this day. So consider when you displace uh, some of the natural habitat, what does that do to the carrying capacity of what remains? The wildlife have to uh, coexist with the built infrastructure and, and the way that impacts an airport, especially is in terms of bird strikes. Our airport is probably one of the highest uh, listed airports in terms of number of occurrences of bird strikes. So there's a significant, significant impact from that. Again, the urban ecology encroaching on the airport is very similar to what you'd see in a city. And we believe that we have a, a symbiotic relationship with the city because it's through the access, the efficient access for people and freight that helps to trigger or stimulate economic growth within the region. But it also um, uh, initiates a, a need for us to be responsible in the way we manage it. But as I compare our growth to a city, it's important to recognize that our airport is kind of like a city within a city. Um, you know, we've seen over the years, our campus change, the, the features on our campus change. Uh, you can even see um, um, in this part of the airport, that's actually a professional golf course. So there's a lot of infrastructure. There's a lot of uh, social systems. There's a lot of infrastructure systems. And uh, we have, a, you know, an expansive ecological system that still exists at the airport. Um, that's we're about 23% forested area at the airport. So to talk about our perspective on sustainability, um, ask the question, what's the role of sustainability and why is it important, right? Um, the, the most commonly recognizable uh, definition of sustainability or sustainable development comes from the Brundtland Commission definition, which is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising future generations for meeting their own needs. And so why is it important? Um, it's becoming more and more important because we're understanding that the connection, the linkages between human activity and uh, the environmental consequences are starting to become irreversible if we don't take bold action. So that, and, and for us, what we found at the airport is sustainability actually provides a very balanced approach to the way that we manage the complex issues that we encounter uh, at the intersection of all of these different systems that uh, interconnect and uh, are integrated. But at the end of the day, what is our desired outcome? We strive for sustainable uh, outcomes and resilient ecosystem, healthy and resilient ecosystems. And in order to do that, we have to ensure that we build our infrastructure in a way that recognizes the importance of the ecological functions um, and, and the consequences for uh, displacing them without considering the benefits they provide to us. So one of the uh, quotes that I really love uh, that I read recently, uh, thanks to one of my uh, friends, Hal Knowles, Dr. Knowles, was from Joseph Tainter, where he mentioned social complexity and sustainability emerged from successful problem solving rather than directly from environmental conditions. And what why that stood out to me is that early in my tenure, when I came to the airport, my mission was to ensure that there was a balance between uh, the industrial operations at the airport and the environmental laws. But a, a strong focus on environmental compliance doesn't necessarily lend itself to actually 
solving problems in a significant manner. So what we started to do is started to actually study the underlying root causes and link them to the environmental conditions. So think about environmental conditions like air quality, water quality, noise pollution, and so on. And I'll speak a little bit more about that uh, as we go through. The next statement uh, from his paper was on the development of complexity in these systems and how it complicates uh, problem solving. Um, there's an urgency to take action that we are trying to um, uh, highlight for people, but it's very difficult if they don't see the tangible impacts of the consequences um, uh, in terms that resonate with them. And so what we have to do is really work on um, illustrating the benefits of uh, um, mapping out the system dynamics and the networks and the interactions, and then showing the evolution of the, the long, short and long-term consequences. Um, and the ability to understand and control complexity is a key aspect of our, our work with NREL because the tools that they're bringing to bear are really helping to simplify the way that we look, we see our world and how we go about solving the problems. So when you think about the airport as a complex ecosystem, I'm talking about a social, ecological, infrastructural system. Think about it, the boundaries of the airport uh, are porous because they allow us to have access to the key resources that we depend on. Resources like uh, energy the, and water supply, communications, um, uh, transportation systems, because without ground transportation, uh, people in freight can't get to and from the airport. But at the same time, we also have flows that go into the surrounding communities, flows like air pollution and noise pollution, and we can impact water. We also impact the development of land around the airport. Um, again, going back to the comparison between airports and cities, although they're similar because our airport has our own police and fire department, um, our own public work functions, um, we're very different because we also allow aircraft to land and take off, which is a very complex operation. Um, what are, one of the things I wanted to do is show a couple of examples of, of the points I mentioned before. The first example is really around uh, the environmental condition of air quality. In the 90s, the North Texas region was listed as non-attainment for ozone. And that was because the EPA had determined that the, the air quality levels, which were driven by emissions from NOx emissions, um, we're not meeting healthy air quality standards. And one of the things you can take away from this particular graph is that you can see with the progression of time, not only have the concentrations come down because they've investigated the root causes, but you've also seen that as our understanding of the linkages to human health has, has increased, you can see the standards become progressively lower. And so we're still, we still have work to do in order to meet the healthy air quality standards and promote health within the region. But you can at least see that there are um, significant understanding of, between the root causes uh, of, of uh, the air pollution. But as our understanding of those root causes um, expands, we're also developing new insights into more effective ways of addressing these. So in 2012, you see that um, more than 50% of the emission sources were coming from on-road vehicles. The airports at the time were contributing approximately 4%. Flash forward to 2020, when about 30, 38% of the regional sources of emissions were on-road vehicles. So it was reduced, but the airports in that time doubled their, their impact or contribution. You may ask, why is that? Because if you think about the growth of the region, the fastest growing metro area, the amount of congestion on the roadways, it's the improvement in vehicle technologies, the efficiency, the emission control technologies that improved over time that allowed us to uh, uh, decrease the impact from on-road vehicles. In the aviation sector, as you can imagine, it's a lot more difficult to upgrade those technologies and economics play a key role in that happening. But as you'll hear about with from Caleb, a lot of the tools that we're understanding is um, 
deconstructing things like congestion within the region and how it connects to the airport's operations are provide us new opportunities to create more significant impacts on congestion. So the other example I'd like to highlight for you is the difficulty when we're talking about complex ecosystems, it's really the difficulty of decision-making and the scales uh, and, and how, they, how they affect or how they cascade down, whether to the local region or cascade up to the on the national level. But in order to do that, I need to set the context. If you think about the way our roadway systems function, we have uh, highways, uh, interstate roadways and in city roadways, and those allow us to move efficiently from point A to point B. In the airspace, the national airspace is divided into segments, but in each specific region or metro area, there are more specific um, guidance or highway. Uh, there's a virtual box, for example, within our metro area, and that allows the FAA to control the arrivals and departure of aircraft into our airspace. So if you can imagine, as you see on the, on the left side, aircraft that are entering the region enter through the corner post of the box. Um, however, when they're departing, they depart through the cardinal headings, north, south, east, and west. Now, now um, that's important because that allows the aircraft to remain separated uh, as they operate within a congested metro area. But the example I wanted to share is really about a decision made on um, by the at the federal level where uh, the desire was to upgrade the, the systems and the technologies based on a modern approach. Prior to our nav or area nav navigation, the, air the control of aircraft was really dictated by ground-based navigational aids and aircraft were navigating from uh, uh, navigation, uh, um, the ground-based location one to another location. And that's how they map their path to get from an origin to destination. It was very inefficient. It promoted longer routes and more fuel burn and emissions. And as you can see on the left, there were a lot of over flights, areas being overflown. Now with the advent of satellite technology, that actually allowed them to create more efficient paths in the sky. And you can see on the right, a much more refined distribution of air, air traffic. Now here's the challenge and how it cascades down. When those paths are being designed, and we've seen this in several other locations, if there's not a study of the underlying land use, then those, even though the amount of traffic um, or areas being overflown is reduced, you tend to see a, con a more concentrated uh, distribution of traffic over um, specific areas. And that means more frequent aircraft, more frequent uh, noise uh, and emissions, associated emissions. So one of the things that we're required to do is really engage at the community level proactively so that they understand the changes. We also engage with the FAA to understand the impacts of that because without considering the sensitivities of the development in those communities, um, there's a lot of harm that can be done. And we've seen this happen in other areas like in Phoenix, where when they modernize their uh, airspace, um, some of the new flight paths were oriented over historical areas that did not have the, the capabilities of modernizing their homes with sound attenuation and maintain their historical designation. So this is how a federal decision can cascade down to a local level, but also in fact impact the communities around the airport, which is why we view the surrounding community as a key element of the airport. Just to give you another sense of how aircraft um, operate traditionally, um, we monitor airspace activity. We have some amazing tools that uh, are tracking aircraft movement, and that's what you can see across here. On the left, you can see a south flow. So aircraft land and take off into the wind. So when they flow, uh, the airflow, the wind direction is coming from 
the south to the north, aircraft are landing towards the south, as you see on the left. And that, that represents about 70% of the patterns that we see throughout the year. 30% is really north flow when they're departing to the north. West flow, which is very unusual and very infrequent, happens less than 1%. And then with weather, uh, aircraft have to navigate around those heavy cells, and we call those irregular operations. As you can imagine, every time there's a change in flight pattern, it triggers uh, new experiences for people who don't typically see those types of patterns. One of the other things that we do uh, are required to do is uh, by law, we're required to ensure that aircraft noise levels do not exceed the predicted levels. So in our area, we deployed a local network of noise monitors, and that allows us to understand uh, the impact or the, sen the impact of no aircraft activity on the surrounding community. Now, when, when there are long-term exceedances expected, we're uh, obligated to provide some type of mitigation um, for at the community level. Um, a recent example of where that went awry was in Denver. Uh, they were recently ordered to pay $33.5 million for violating uh, aircraft noise um, obligations that they agreed to. So that's some of the impacts that can be created by that. Now, if you think about the complexity of the airport system, while you have the air movement of, of people in freight, think about balancing that with the ground transportation system. And how do, how do we uh, coordinate their movement so that we can achieve greater system efficiencies and reduce the amount of emissions? Because if you have a lot of traffic showing up, creating congestion curbside, that contributes to regional uh, lo local air quality um, and so on. So it's a very complex problem. There are very complex problems and require a lot of tools and data to understand and properly describe them. Now, one of the other things that we do with data is we analyze complaints by city and by root cause. I think that's a very unique process that we started at, uh, at the airport. And we really wanted to understand the sensitivities to the communities. And what we were able to do is really distill them by root cause. And the root causes you see in the table on the right. So for the period, from June to October of last year, there was a runway closure. And uh, you can see the breakdown and the distribution of complaints by city. And then on the, the, the chart on the right, the root cause. And the takeaway from that is almost 50% of the complaints you see were really driven by the use of one runway. And that's the orange runway you see at the top right, the Western diagonal runway. Um, so what we do with that information is, as we understand the sensitivities, um, we are able to engage the, the folk on the ground who are doing the planning and the operational shifts and help them to understand the community sensitivities. We also proactively engage the community so they understand what to expect and are not as uh, you know, disturbed um, by the changes in flight operations. Now, if I go on to talk about other threats to our ecosystem, I'll go through this very quickly. Um, drought, the Texas region has experienced some significant droughts historically. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, prior to 2015, we had the area, the lakes across the state that were almost dry. We had a city of Wich Wichita Falls that was within less than 60 days of clean drinking water supply. So these are significant issues. We have the hot Texas summers. I remember early on when I first started traveling to Texas, what an eye-opening experience to um, discover that at 10 o'clock at night, the temperature is still 100 degrees. So what that translates to for us is with the increasing number of 100 degree days, we're seeing unprecedented um, stresses on our electric grid um, and they become unstable, meaning the electric supply is no longer reliable. And so if we lose electric supply, um, that's one of the flows that we depend on for our operational and we're a mission critical facility. This year we were introduced again to the fact that yes, it does snow in Texas. Um, and when it snows, 
uh, that we still are required to maintain the runways and taxiways in a safe manner and the roadway systems so that aircraft can still operate. The, the, um, the airlines do have an expectation that the airport prepares our infrastructure to allow them to operate as an all weather airport. So all of these factors, there's a really interesting model that uh, we've been looking at and studying and applying to our situation here. It's this, this model of risk, right? If you think about threats, known and unknown threats, their consequence, and you understand or are able to quantify the vulnerability that we have to those, then we can better plan on how we recover or absorb or how we absorb the disruption to our critical functions, how we recover quicker, how we adapt to prevent future disruptions. These are important lessons that we're learning that will revolutionize the way that we operate and make decisions. And then I'll close with this uh, uh, before I pass it on to my colleagues. In the conventional system, decisions are made in silos. In many complex ecosystems, decisions are made in silos. A lot of the decisions are also made based on cost. But as we are seeing the challenges that are happening in the 21st century, where we're seeing you know, a, a global pandemic that is um, uh, intersecting with um, a, a, an unprecedented winter event, on top of that, an energy disruption. These types of compounded threats are becoming more and more um, impactful to our future, our, our sustained operations. So that's, that's one of the motivations for us to really drive towards more of a collaborative decision-making using data-driven insights and really making decisions based on the values that we aspire to achieve at, at the end of the day. So uh, I apologize for the uh, technical issues at the front end, but with that, I'll quit there and uh, hand over to Caleb for you to get some insights into the tools that NREL provides to us. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Robert. Uh, with any luck, uh, my slides are visible now. Yes, they are. Okay, yes, good. thanks Robert. I, I double checked that I could advance them too, but I, I have to say I'm, I'm now concerned <laughs> that, that they're gonna get stuck. Um, so thanks everyone. Thanks Robert, that was a great talk. I really enjoyed that. Um, so I, I think it's a, a good segue, uh, especially you know, with Robert ending on, on this topic of um, you know, getting away from silo decision-making and more uh, collaborative interdisciplinary work. Um, you know, hopefully I'll, I'll be able to speak to that a bit in my talk here. Um, so let's see, very good. So um, before I sort of dive in, I wanna tell you a little bit about myself, who's talking to you for the next 15 or 20 minutes or so. Um, so I'm a senior scientist at the National Renewable Energy Lab. I lead the data analysis and visualization group, which is a group of about 30 scientists in the Computational Sciences Center. Uh, I also have uh, appointments at two universities. So I'm an assistant adjunct professor at the University of Colorado. Uh, I teach at CU uh, data science and geospatial data analysis. And I also maintain a visiting research faculty appointment at Stanford uh, with the School of Medicine. I do a bit of um, medical and pu public health research um, in my evenings and weekends. Um, my background is computer science, computer systems, optimization, machine learning, and statistical modeling. Uh, so if you're not familiar with the National Laboratory System, uh, there are 17 uh, national laboratories that are funded and, and organized by the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, we're that green dot right in the middle of Colorado there in Golden, Colorado, that's National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Um, it's really a great lab in the sense that we have a mission dedicated to uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy technologies. Um, but together, these 17 labs really uh, help uh, steer the nation in, in its energy portfolio and do cutting edge work um, related to um, energy and defense issues as well. 
Um, so I work in this, this building uh, down on the right here, at least when I can go there. Um, we've been working remotely for a little while. Um, so the Computational Sciences Center is composed of my group, the Data Analysis and Visualization Group, um, also the Simulation and Optimization Group, the Complex Fluid Dynamics Group, and then our HPC Operations Group. So um, within that building uh, where my desk is, there's also a supercomputer named Eagle that we take care of. Um, it's, the, it's our newest supercomputer, it replaced its predecessor, uh, Peregrine, um, and these are supercomputing facilities that are user facilities so that uh, folks from universities um, or other national laboratories can use them. But what's special about our facility is that it's really dedicated to the renewable energy and energy efficiency research. Uh, so my group, the data analysis and visualization group is responsible for uh, three main tasks around the lab and we act in a, a sort of consulting capacity. We uh, work with just about uh, every research area at the lab um, in helping with data analysis, data management, uh, advanced data visualization, and data modeling. Um, so my background is more so in the machine learning and the data modeling aspect, but we have folks on our team that represent um, all of these aspects and we uh, consult on uh, dozens of projects um, each uh, um, throughout the lab. Uh, so as I make a transition to talking about the, the work with DFW, I just wanted to start with this slide. Um, so I think this is a compelling example of how quickly systems can change um, in response to uh, sort of disruptive technologies or unexpected events. Um, so on the left here, you have a picture of the Easter Day Parade in New York City in 1900. And on the right is the same parade 13 years later in 1913. And what you'll notice if you look is that um, on the left, it's all horse-drawn carriages and there's one automobile highlighted. And then just 13 years later, it's all automobiles and one uh, stubborn individual with their uh, horse-drawn carriage. And so, you know, I saw this slide a few years ago, my lab director um, showed it to me and I thought it was a really compelling example of how um, massive systems can change in response to technological uh, changes or triggers. Um, so what are some of those triggers that we're seeing in our in our transportation system right now? So um, as we look at a system like an airport or the transportation system as a whole, uh, we see that we're moving towards autonomous vehicles. Um, we're seeing increasing electrification um, of our uh, um, energy services generally, but also specifically um, our uh, ground support equipment, our airplanes are making the move towards uh, electric operation eventually. And of course, passenger vehicles um, are increasingly becoming electric. Um, we're seeing ubiquitous fast shipping. So everybody sort of expects that they can uh, place an order online and get it in two days now. Um, that has impacts for our transportation system. It's required a lot of changes in the freight sector. And then we're also seeing urbanization um, and demand increasing. So there's increasing demand for uh, airport services, COVID notwithstanding, um, and more people are moving into cities um, and they're expecting to be able to move around easily for work. And so they're using airports to make that happen. Um, meanwhile, there are changes to the services that are available that have disrupted operations at airports um, and other major transportation hubs. So there's a cautionary tale in the form of the rise of Uber and Lyft um, and its effect on parking. And so on the left, you can see the growth in TNC trips. So that's sort of your Uber and Lyft trips to the airport between the years of 2016 and 2018. And then in the bottom plot shows the impact on revenue during that same time period um, for several airports. Um, so this is, I think, a really important uh, kind of effect to observe. Um, I don't think many airports thought that, that this technology would change their operations so significantly, but uh, parking being a major source of revenue for airports coming into some uncertainty uh, has required a, a decent amount of agility that the airports maybe previously didn't have to think about in terms of how to organize their surface transport and revenue models. Uh, meanwhile, we have lots of changes 
uh, and, and emerging technologies in the technology sector. So I'll just highlight a few that I think are really uh, have a high degree of potential to be revolutionary. Uh, so video analytics and Internet of Things, the idea that, that we will eventually have sensors everywhere, um, sort of monitoring uh, operations. If you think about an airport, the idea of video analytics, tracking vehicles, uh, computing dwell time at the curb front, uh, measuring the capacity and the fill of, of parking resources. Um, you know, these are all sort of near term options um, that are uh, being deployed by some of our nation's uh, biggest airports. Um, meanwhile, digitalization, data warehouses. Um, this is something that we've been talking about for a long time, but I think we're really just seeing a significant investment in these kinds of technologies in the last uh, three to five years, say. Um, machine learning and AI is the latest buzzword, um, but I think it's, it's reaching a level of maturity where uh, folks have accepted that this isn't just um, you know, sort of a, a nice idea, but is actually seeing some impacts day to day in, in terms of our major infrastructure um, and how it affects their operations. And then finally, high fidelity digital twin models um, is sort of more advanced, uh, more uh, nascent, uh, but uh, is, is certainly affecting how we think about modeling these systems. Um, so I've, I've put this technology hype cycle, and maybe some of you have seen this before, but I, you, when I'm talking about emerging technologies, I just wanna be frank that, that there is some hype associated with these. And so I've tried to place these approximately where I think they are on this hype curve, um, moving from technology trigger through inflated expectations, in disillusionment, and eventually out to a plateau of productivity. Um, so, you know, video analytics and IoT, digital twins, we're still very much coming up the curve. Um, perhaps we have inflated expectations about what these can do exactly, or we're getting to a, that point. Machine learning and AI, I think we're on the far side of the curve. We're starting to realize that this is really a revolutionary set of technologies, um, and we're uh, starting to understand which are the problems. Uh, where they can really make an impact. Um, and then digitalization and data warehousing. Um, we've known for some time now that, that moving to more digital in infrastructure, um, sort of breaking down these organizational silos in terms of data infrastructure is really valuable and we're seeing major investments at this point. Um, so with that context, I wanna tell you about the project that we've been working on with Dallas-Fort Worth. Um, so this is a project called Athena, which stands for Advancing Transportation Hubs Efficiency with Novel Analytics. Um, this is a three-year project with five million in federal funds and a million and a quarter in cost share, so a total budget of about six and a quarter million dollars. It's a collaboration between Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, NREL, and Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So really the the big picture idea behind this project is that we want to try to leverage um, modern computational tools like high performance computing, supercomputing facilities, um, and data modeling and uh, data analysis expertise to solve problems in our transportation sector. Uh, that's a big problem. There's a lot of ways to go about that. Um, maybe an airport is a reasonable place to start. Uh, the nice thing about an airport is you have one owner uh, it's basically a city uh, in and of itself in terms of the, the number of vehicles moving to and around the airport. But with one owner, you have uh, sort of one entity to ask uh, for data. And that creates significantly lower barriers in terms of doing the kind of work we want to do. Um, so this project is really about leveraging Department of Energy resources to help the transportation sector and applying them initially uh, to an airport. Um, so one of the really exciting parts of this project for me is how many stakeholders and collaborators we've been able to bring to the table. So in addition to DFW and uh, North Central Texas Council of Governments in uh, Texas, we've also been working with a number of other airports. So Denver International Airport, uh, LAX, uh, Port of Seattle, uh, Port Authority of New York, New Jersey, including their three airports and their seaport, uh, the Port of Long Beach, um, Atlanta Hartsfield Jackson International Airport. Uh, we have an agreement with UPS, uh, Toyota, uh, a couple of universities, including New York University of Michigan and uh, Texas State University, American Airlines uh, is 
uh, providing data for this study as well. And we have an agreement with Uber. Um, so when we started to talk to some of these entities about this project, I think that they realized that this was a uh, exciting um, place to work. You know, maybe it was sort of the right time to be thinking about applying data analytics uh, to airports. And so they were uh, eager to come on board. Um, one thing that's been really important for the Department of Energy and as the sponsor of this work is that we develop solutions, not just for Dallas Fort Worth, but that we think about developing a generalizable approaches that could apply to any uh, airport or seaport even. Um, having this advisory board or this set of stakeholders is really important for keeping us honest in that regard. So, so we meet with this group, we tell them uh, sort of what we've been working on, and then the airports in particular uh, let us know, hey, you know, that's a great idea for Dallas Fort Worth, but but you would need to make this change for it to work at my airport. And that's been a really valuable uh, tool as we've developed this work. Um, so where are we at? We're, we're about two and a half years into this three year project, um, starting to look at what the second phase will look like. Um, there are five main threads of research that we've been committed to, uh, roughly divided into three and two operations and planning. Um, so on the operations side of the house, uh, we've been working on shuttle optimization and electric vehicle analysis. So trying to help Dallas, Fort Worth and other airports figure out how to integrate electric shuttles into their shuttle, uh, shuttle operations and also make changes to day-to-day uh, -day operations to take advantage of potential ways to improve um, the efficiency of the services while not uh, adversely impacting customer service. Um, that work is more or less complete. Uh, we've published a couple papers on it, um, and, uh, and it's currently influencing uh, strategy uh, for the airport. Uh, the second piece of work on the operations side is curbside congestion and policies. So the idea there is, can we understand what the root causes are of uh, curbside congestion within the central terminal area of the airport? Can we understand uh, what policies may be uh, useful to uh, mitigate it? Uh, so that work involves building a micro simulation capability and a machine learning framework, which together we call a digital twin. It lets us model in detail the surface transportation that's happening at the airport and then use that to ask what if questions about uh, policies and outcomes in the day-to-day -day operations. So I'll talk about that a little bit more later. That work is also uh, more or less complete and uh, we've uh, published a uh, number of papers on it. Um, the freight modeling work that we're doing as part of this has, has a, an analogy to our curbside congestion. Um, what we're trying to do there is understand uh, freight vehicles coming into and out, out of the airport uh, area, how do they impact surrounding transit uh, or surrounding traffic and, and could we make changes to the policies or schedules or roadway networks around the airport to uh, decrease conflict between uh, those freight vehicles and the other uh, kinds of, of traffic. Um, so that, that work is about 50% developed at this point. We've been collecting data from our partners and modeling it. Um, and that's uh, something that we're hoping to finish up this year. Um, on the planning side of the house, we have a project on mode choice modeling. So that's really foundational piece of this work. Um, we use some data that was collected in 2015 and 2016 to build a model for people, for how people make their choices about how they're going to get to and from the airport. We've used that in our, in our other models and we're currently working with the airport to collect data uh, and, in an updated survey to understand how people are making their choices now, how they may make choices um, in the presence of emerging technologies like autonomous vehicles, and also how COVID has impacted the choices that they make on how they get to and from the airport. Um, finally, this infrastructure planning and decision making is sort of the, the combination of all of these previous threads of work. What we're doing there is trying to take our digital twin for the airport, take our mode choice model, um, our shuttle uh, model and our EV analysis, and combine them to create an optimization framework that will help the airport think about uh, infrastructure investments they can make between now and say 2045. Uh, specifically, we're looking at at ways to manage curb front resources and parking. I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but that work is sort of actively running on the supercomputer right now. We're hoping to finish it up this year.
I'm at the bottom of the slide here, I have a picture of the team. So uh, without intending to, I'm taking credit for a lot of people's work um, in giving this talk. Um, so we have a great team. Uh, this was a, a gathering that we had at Oak Ridge National Lab a couple of years ago when we were able to meet in person, of course. Uh, so thanks to all of them for their hard work. Uh, so we have uh, been pretty productive in publishing this work. Um, we've given a number of presentations. Um, we've been actively participating um, in TRB and a few other venues. Uh, I think we have three journal articles that were just accepted this month um, that aren't represented on this slide. But uh, being that this is an academic audience, um, you know, I'm happy to provide links to papers um, if there are things that you're particularly interested in. Um, we also have a website, uh, athena-mobility.org, where our publications list is kept up to date. And we also have some nice uh, summaries of some of the research results. Um, so I'll just sort of briefly go through some of these research highlights, give you um, sort of a view through the project management into some of the data and results. Um, this is going to be a whirlwind tour, so I'll sort of highlight six uh, projects um, within the umbrella of Athena very quickly. Um, so on the left, we have our shuttle bus optimization work. So what, what we were really trying to do here is figure out if there is a better way for DFW to operate uh, their shuttle services and how to maybe integrate electric vehicles into that vision. Um, so what we did was we developed an optimization model um, and a, a simulator uh, and we coupled them in such a way uh, with data that was collected on the existing shuttles uh, to come up with a set of new or optimal routes. Um, what we effectively found without going into great depth about how DFW operates its shuttles um, is that they could make no change um, to the current routes, but just change the frequency of the shuttles to better match the demand of passengers uh, throughout the day and throughout the week. And they could save about 40% um, in terms of energy usage of those vehicles. Um, if they optimize the routes, so basically change the, the routes that the buses are driving uh, several times throughout the day and, and each day of the week to better take into account uh, unevenness in the way uh, passengers are arriving and departing from different terminals, they could save 50 or, or more percent um, of the total energy use. Um, since these are CNG, vehicles now that is a substantial uh, savings in um, emissions. Uh, in the future, if they're electric vehicles, it would also uh, mean uh, fewer emissions um, from the grid, but also uh, sort of reduced operating costs and charging needs. Uh, a second piece of work is this CTA congestion um, and future mode analysis. So I, I referenced this before, the idea is to, to create a high resolution model of the central terminal area and try to understand how um, vehicles are moving around the airport and what are the root causes of, of congestion. Um, I think really the, the big takeaway from this work for me uh, is this, this plot sort of at the, at the center left on the right side of the slide, which um, shows uh, congestion or delay in the terminal as a function of time between now and 2045. Um, what we saw when we ran this scenario is that um, as soon as about 2030 on high demand days, um, the airport would reach a state of gridlock um, with no changes. So the airport is planning to grow, is planning to add a sixth terminal, but if they weren't to add that additional infrastructure, they would start to uh, reach capacity of their existing facilities on those high demand days and uh, as soon as 10 years. Um, so we looked at a few different ways uh, we could try to prevent that and, and uh, without going into great detail, um, some uh, small shifts to public transit could make a, a huge impact, even having as little as, as five or 10% of uh, passengers use public transit could uh, delay the need for costly infrastructure investments by as much as 20 years. Um, meanwhile, some technologies like autonomous vehicles in our models actually showed that congestion could arrive sooner because more people would be taking single occupancy vehicles. 
um, than were previously. So that to us highlighted how we need to think about these emerging technologies and take care in how they're integrated into the airport um, operations ecosystem. Um, our mode choice model, which was published in TRB and it's a journal article in, in TRR this year. Um, the idea there is to build upon previous uh, uh, work to model mode choice using the data at DFW um, and expand it with a parking model. Um, so uh, really the important part of that work is that we can in, in detail for an airport like DFW uh, take into account the choices that that individuals make and how they get to the airport and if they decide to park, what uh, kind of parking they ultimately use. Um, so this gives us a more granular view of the mode choices than has been previously available. And this is a really important input um, to the other models. Uh, this, these plots on the bottom left um, uh, is a sensitivity analysis. And in that work, we also looked at how sensitive individuals would be based on these models to changes in pricing for these various products. This is a pretty useful outcome. Um, on the right uh, is a piece of work that we did. This was recently accepted uh, to a journal for publication uh, where we tried to forecast future demand at the airport using previous data. So this is again an important input to some of our other models. Uh, we evaluated a number of different machine learning and time series modeling approaches and ultimately using a deep neural network we're able to get uh, very uh, good predictions of future demand at the airport. Uh, so what you could effectively imagine this kind of tooling being used for uh, is uh, to allow a day, week, or month ahead planning of demand um, and adjustment of sort of operational expectations or capabilities uh, day to day. Uh, we also did some analysis of uh, COVID impacts and how the demand um, and vehicle arrivals at the airport were affected by COVID and maybe how uh, risk uh, of disease spread uh, influenced or didn't influence those as well. Uh, fifth piece of work is this digital twin on the left. So um, uh, what we're trying to do here is working with our freight partner. We're trying to understand the arrival and departure process for, for freight vehicles coming into and out of the airport. And as I said before, how they interact with surrounding traffic. Uh, we're using machine learning to predict the volume of uh, freight vehicles. Uh, we also use that then with a queuing model to predict queue lengths at the, at the freight facilities. It can happen during a uh, high volume times that, that trucks waiting to come in uh, to a bay will back up and block traffic. This especially happens at uh, Port of Long Beach, um, for instance, in our discussions with them. So we wanted to understand how many trucks were waiting to sort of offload or load. Um, and then we use that to feed a micro simulation model uh, using the software Sumo to see how uh, those vehicles uh, interact with other vehicles in the surrounding area. Um, and then lastly, our infrastructure expansion work, which I mentioned before. So this uses a three-stage modeling approach with a progressive hedging optimization. Um, and what we're trying to do here is understand um, what the trade-offs are in terms of uh, pricing, um, construction of additional curb resources, and uh, construction or conversion of parking resources. So uh, really what we're learning from this work is that uh, demand-based pricing is an extremely powerful tool for managing congestion within the airport. Um, and that uh, with relatively small investments in, in a remote curb, which is effectively a, a drop-off spot away from the central terminal area and some demand pricing, we can mitigate a, a lot of congestion in future years at the airport with uh, sort of minimal infrastructure costs and actually significant uh, potential revenue um, uh, for the airport. Um, so that's all I have. Sherry, would you like to take it? Yep, I think you need to stop sharing so that I can share. Absolutely. And then uh, I am a little bit nervous about repeating earlier, uh, <laughs> earlier challenges. So we'll see. It seems like this should work. So. Very good. Thanks, Sherry. Awesome. All right. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yep. Awesome. Always great when that works. 
Um, so hi everybody. Um, just uh, I'm I'm Sherry Stout and see if I now my slides aren't advancing. Hold on. Um, maybe. Hmm. There we go. All right, um, so yeah, I'm Sherry Stout. I'm the Arctic Strategic Program Manager um, at National Renewable Energy Lab. And you might be thinking, okay, why is someone who works in the Arctic uh, talking about airports in Dallas? Um, and so uh, the other hat that I wear is I'm also a senior research engineer. Um, and primarily my focus really is on uh, resilience in rural, remote and developing communities. Um, so I work a lot internationally, um, obviously with Arctic communities as my other, uh, my other job title would, would sort of suggest. Um, but then I do a lot of joint resilience planning between military bases or federal facilities and their surrounding and supporting communities. Um, I also work a lot in disaster recovery, um, primarily in island and remote communities, not exclusively, um, but places like Puerto Rico. The picture right here is a Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida. Um, and so basically I have a lot of fun. Um, I'm an environmental engineer by training, um, but I'm also doing a PhD, oddly enough, in behavioral science um, looking at leading in complex change. Um, so really with the goal of understanding how do people actually adopt technology and become more resilient and deal with climate change. Um, so today we're going to be talking a little bit, um, kind of bits and pieces from some of the previous presenters on when we're looking at resilience and resilience planning, like what does that mean? And how do we do that um, from a national lab perspective at NREL? Um, and, and how do some of these tools, like what Caleb just talked about, play into this? How do some of the equity issues, like what Robert talked about, play into this? And, and how do we do resilience planning? Um, so just a couple of foundational concepts up front. Um, resilient, reliable, safe, secure electricity is, is necessary for the economy. Um, you know, the, the goal is not electrons. Electrons are cool because we're engineers, but no one else thinks electrons are all that cool. They want the lights to work. Um, they want uh, vehicles to drive. They, they want wastewater and water treatment plants to work. And so when we start looking at resilience, we want to look at systems thinking, not just electrons. Um, and resilience really does not happen in a bubble. Um, so often we sort of want to say, is this component resilient? And it might be, but is the component resilient within the system in which it in which it lives? Um, so when we look at communities or federal agencies and how they work together, you know, we're literally looking at sort of region-wide resilience. And that includes, you know, if we're looking at facilities like airports or water ports, we do work with those as well. Um, what does that mean for region-wide or even global resilience? So just a few upfront definitions, and I think we've kind of bounced all over these today. Um, but when we talk about resilience, what do we mean? Um, so at its most basic level, resilience really just refers to the ability to recover from um, some application of stress. Um, but that's a really, really reduced definition of resilience. Uh, my master's thesis was in resilience um, about nine years ago before resilience was cool. And there were over 100 definitions of resilience in the US federal system alone. So it's really hard to define this word. Um, so when NREL talks about resilience, when it comes to resilience planning, Couple, I want to point out a couple of things. We, we bring in that anticipate, prepare for, and adapt. So like you're looking forward to changing con conditions and then withstanding and responding to. So you're, you're hanging on through changing conditions, but then you're also recovering from disruptions uh, through holistic planning, but also technical solutions. Um, when we talk to utilities, often they're talking about reliability. What are our outage statistics? Um, how, how are we providing power quality? But we really just want to bring that, that definition out and expand it. Um, it's more than reliability. It's economic resilience. It's readiness for, for climate change. Um, how do you operationalize flexibility into your system? What does energy affordability look like? And how does that play into resilience or justice issues? Um, and then the ability to shift resources around um, when needed. Um, and so we'll go through a little bit of what that looks like. Um, but a couple more. Um, see. Screen froze on me. See if I can get this going again. Um, there we go. Um, a couple more definitions. Um, and then again, we've sort of hit all of these. This is a map off of a, 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 a tool called MOPS, but it's this is today's current hazards. I brought this up a few hours ago to say, what are the current hazards? All of those red dots are COVID. Um, and so, and they're new COVID cases. Um, so when we talk about hazards, we're looking at an event that's really out of your control. It's something that it can expose a vulnerability, but you can't control it. We cannot control the, the rise of a new virus or a pandemic. Uh, you know, we cannot control some of these climate hazards that are coming our way. Doesn't mean we have no role in mitigating them um, or reducing, you know, 
um, greenhouse gas emissions, but in terms of the actual hazard itself, we don't have control over it. That's really what a hazard means. It's some sort of event or a threat, an earthquake, a pandemic um, that we don't have control over. We do have some control over vulnerabilities. So there are weaknesses within infrastructure or systems or processes that can be modified um, and maybe mitigated to either prevent um, some sort of major disruption from occurring or at least lessen the impact of that disruption. Um, and so vulnerabilities can be identified sometimes through tools, but also I really wanna emphasize, and we'll talk about this more through stakeholders, stakeholder interviews, literature reviews. Obviously there is that data of past events, but stakeholders are really key to this process. And then risk. Risk is ultimately just the product of the two. So it's the product of the threat likelihood and the vulnerability severity. Um, it should be, you know, maybe obvious, maybe not, that not all threats are going to expose all vulnerabilities. And so it's not necessarily a one for one. Every vulnerability and hazard has a paired risk. That may not be the case. Um, and some vulnerabilities and hazards have multiple risks. So it's not necessarily a one for one that your risk is going to directly ref reflect the hazards that you face. It could reflect a few other things, but it's really the potential for loss, damage, or destruction um, when, when a threat happens and exposes a vulnerability. And so this is just an overview of our resilience planning process. And, and when we go into the q and I'll, I'll pop this into the chat. We have uh, tools for people looking at uh, these kinds of assessments within the U.S., within state local governments, within um, you know, federal systems. We also have these for international governments and for developing country governments um, that kind of run through this process. But this process is, is basically the same um, in, in all the ways that NREL tackles resilience with sort of one caveat. This is a nice, cute little like linear process. In reality, that assessment and review basically starts this process, process over again. It's not truly lin linear, it's really circular in that every time you build resilience, you go back and reassess and, and gather more data and continually update this process. So one of the things um, that I'm really going to hit on today is when we talk about community considerations and planning, um, and, and Robert really hit on this, uh, Caleb sort of mentioned this as well in terms of some of the stakeholder things, is we're not just looking at the built environment. Um, so often we get asked like, hey, we want to, you know, community comes to us, we want to be resilient, make us resilient. And they're really talking about, we want to harden physical systems. Cool. We can definitely help with that. That doesn't necessarily mean that system is now resilient. We also want to look at what's the natural environment doing and what's the social environment doing, because those play a role as well. So just going to go through some specific vulnerabilities. And, and I'm using Texas on purpose, just because this was a, obviously a recent event here. But also, I think it illustrates really well how some of these systems play, play in together. Um, but vulnerabilities in the built environment, the biggest one we hear from people like, what vulnerabilities do you have? Every utility is going to stand up and say aging infrastructure um, or infrastructure that's not the right size for what it's serving. And so those are pretty common built environment um, vulnerabilities. Uh, we also see stuff like that first picture I showed, um, infrastructure placed in hazard zones. If your transformers are in the river when it's flooding, nothing good is happening. Um, but also technological defects and materials. The campfire in California um, was both an aging infrastructure issue, but also a material defect, defect issue where a clamp failed. And it failed for a couple of reasons, age being one of them. But when that clamp failed, now you have a huge wildfire. It's a, it's a, it's a vulnerability in the system. Um, another one we often see is just lack of, of adequate operation and maintenance. It's hard to do stuff like vegetation management on millions of miles of distribution line. Um, and so when you're looking at vulnerabilities, that, that O&M really matters. And then in the case of Texas, in some ways, lack of codes and standards. Um, the Texas system was never coded or required to, to be prepared for extreme cold, and thus it wasn't because it was never required to be. And so when we start looking at vulnerabilities in the built environment, and some of those, that codes and standards is also a little bit of a social issue because that's how the regulatory or political structure works. So some of these are overlapping and may fit into multiple categories. When we start looking at the at the natural environment, we also look at just inflexibility to rapid climate change. You know, systems can only handle so much. Um, and then, you know, some of that includes, you know, either natural systems, natural barriers have been removed or they've been developed. For example, a lot of development historically has happened on wetlands. If you think of uh, Washington, D.C., probably shouldn't be a city there. It's basically just a big swamp. Um, and so that was a natural wetland that now doesn't have that adaptive capacity anymore because it's no longer a wetland. Now it's a really developed city. 
Um, and then we also see environments that are really at their threshold of adaptive capacity. Um, so one example that I think might be somewhat fresh in people's minds is if you think about Hurricane Maria and its impacts on Puerto Rico, yeah, you definitely had some of those built environment challenges, you know, with the existing grid, but you also had Hurricane Irma that saturated soils really tore down a lot of infrastructure, followed immediately by Hurricane Maria. So when people think about, about hurricanes and Puerto Rico, they really think Maria because Maria is the one that caused those final outages. But those, but Maria's impacts were very much exacerbated by the fact that Irma happened first. And so that environment just had no more capacity to adapt to a really, really challenging condition. So when we're saying, you know, the, the environments are at that threshold, it means they just can't handle anymore. Um, another community, Cordoba, Alaska, um, in 1964, there was a massive earthquake in, in Alaska. Um, 9.4 earthquake, it caused Cordoba to drop about 12 feet. Um, so it changed what their topography looked like. Then, you know, you have a really big oil spill. Some of you might know the term, might sort of at least in the back of your head have heard of the Exxon Valdez oil spill in Alaska, also Cordoba. Um, and that further exacerbated how, not necessarily how the topography changed, but how the animals respond to that and really how their fisheries responded to that. And so the combined change of that change in topography and the change in really the chemistry of the water related to that oil spill completely changed the ability of the town of Cordova to be adaptive to a lot of, of changing conditions. They've since you know, really come out of that, but, that, but those two events, even though now they've happened decades ago, still, still affect the adaptive capacity of that community. And then we get into this, social vulnerabilities. And these are harder ones to sort of quantify. Often people don't necessarily want to talk about these. These are, you know, these are hard conversations. Um, but we look at, we talk about social vulnerabilities. We're looking at economic disparity. Um, that little chart up there on, on the upper right, a um, little hard to see it in here, but it's looking at the number of outages, um, which is sort of that, that bottom X axis there compared to the population um, living below, um, living, actually this is a minority chart, the population of minorities in the given area. And what we found is, um, and this is out of the Rockefeller Center, who's done some great analysis of that, of that outage. Um, what we found is minority communities experience significantly more outages than non-minority communities. And you, I mean, you see the big bold letters on the bottom there, that's 100% on purpose the blackouts disproportionately affected low income communities. Why is that? And so when we start looking at resilience, what does that mean? Like, what does it mean if your low income communities are disproportionately affected? Um, and typically low income communities have less adaptive capacity. They have less flexibility in schedules and in budgets to recover. Um, they have often more barriers with interacting with government agencies such as FEMA um, related to anything from, from language to um, immigration status. And so you have a lot more barriers when it comes to, to recovery because of that disproportional uh, impact on lower, on lower income communities. And so this is all from Texas. I mean, there's a lot of headlines there. Um, it's on purpose. Um, just go and if you just look at Texas grid outages and justice, just Google that and you'll have dozens of stories pop up about why those blackouts affected communities differently. Um, but often what we see is there's a lack of access to resilient infrastructure. Often those neighborhoods, um, they may not shout the loudest. If something goes wrong, they're not going to be the first one to call the utility and complain and complain and complain until someone comes over. Um, you know, one example in my own life, I have a fairly new to me home. And the first thing I did when I moved in was like, oh, my distribution lines, they have trees in them. I called up the utility and the utility said, oh, we don't really come out uh, for, for issues with, with housing and, and lines. Um, and I called them back and I said, no, these are distribution lines. They're three phase distribution lines. This is a problem. These are between, between um, transformers. And eventually they finally like just relented and sent someone out like, we'll come take a look at it. Guy got here and said, oh, that's a problem. But the reason I could do that is I was able to, to articulate that to my utility in a way that maybe not everybody can. Um, and so you don't necessarily have some of that same access um, to deal with, with vulnerabilities that, that, that people might notice. Um, additionally, there's political barriers. And I don't mean this from political party uh, perspective as much as some political parties just don't wanna work with each other. Um, or so there might be um, you know, different talking points for different 
political parties of one party wants to really focus on the job aspect, one might want to focus on the climate aspect, um, and really bringing those together um, can be its own social uh, vulnerability if parties can't work together. Um, and then just competing priorities and budget, like let's just be real, um, that no community, no airport, um, no country has unlimited budgets. And so when it comes to budgeting, one of the questions we get asked all the time is, how can we convince people that resilience is what they should spend the budget on and not school lunches? That's a hard conversation, uh, and, but it's a real conversation. Um, and so there's these competing priorities and budgets and figuring out how to balance some of those to be able to tackle some of these vulnerabilities within, within the energy and infrastructure system. So when we talk about this, what we're really talking about is compounding risk, that none of these vulnerabilities happens in a vacuum. And so when we look at risk, what we call compounding risk, it's risks that are exacerbated, exacerbated by either underlying or sort of seemingly unrelated conditions. People wouldn't necessarily think, oh, our generation in, in Texas is not designed to handle the cold. You know, we've got these really low-lying vulnerable communities over here that are vulnerable um, to flooding or other climate conditions. And don't really see that there's a connection there. When realistically, there may be a connection there and these unrelated conditions, if something goes wrong in one place of the system, can deeply affect other places of the system because of the interdependencies. Um, so obviously, we're all living in a pandemic. Um, so let's just use COVID as an example. Um, when we started having hurricane season in 2020, uh, the first question was, how do we shelter people? Because historically, what we do is we open up gyms and we open up stadiums and we open up churches and we open up schools and any house that may be deeply affected by a hurricane, we tell people to get out of that house and get to those shelters. Fantastic. How do you do that when you have to be six feet apart and you have to wear masks and, and the, the fear and the danger of spreading, a, of spreading a pretty major disease is ever present? drastically changes how vulnerable your population is. And specifically going back to those vulnerable populations, we tend to see again, more low income communities, typically more deeply affected um, by a lot of hazards. And so a lot of those communities are ones that go to shelters. They may not have the income to go to hotels. They may not have the income to leave the state and, and go stay elsewhere for a few days or even a few weeks. And so they're more reliant on shelters in general also generally more exposed to, to some things like COVID because of, of job types that are essential workers, they're already are more, more exposed to risk of disease. And now we're trying to figure out how do we shelter them all together without causing a major disease event. That's a compounding risk. Um, these are really complex issues. Um, another one, um, Texas, you know, not designed to, to deal with cold. Um, climate change is increasing the likelihood that cold will happen. Um, and then low income uh, populations that have the least adaptive capacity, they may not be able to go out and buy, um, you know, additional additional blankets, they may not, they may not have solar, for example, on, on their rooftops. Uh, you know, most solar in the United States is actually purchased by people that have over 120% of the median income. And so, and while not all of those solar arrays will keep you resilient during a power outage, solar plus batteries or solar plus inverter with a dedicated outlet might, most of these homes don't have access to that. Um, you also in Texas for sure saw a lot of folks that, okay, well, we don't have a generator to generate power, we'll turn on the car. And we're gonna turn on the car in the garage and we're gonna open the door and we're gonna try and use the car to warm up the house. You ended up with dozens of carbon monoxide poisonings because of that decision. And it wasn't that people were stupid to make that decision. It was a rational decision in the moment because of the fear of the cold. And so people didn't have the, the tools they needed to stay warm, didn't have the capacity they needed to come up with another solution to stay warm, and ended up making decisions that made a lot of people sick and even killed some people. And so, you know, we want to avoid those types of compounding risks that really have significant effects on human life. Um, so when we talk about systems planning, now that I've given you like all of the, the horrible bits of, of risk and disaster, like what do we mean by that? Um, and I love that Caleb brought this up. Um, you know, Caleb had some amazing tools to show, but he also talked about stakeholders. So the first rule of planning, engage, 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 um, and include diverse perspectives in that engagement, not just your loudest voices. Your loudest voices are gonna be the people who have the time and the income and really the relationships 
to be loud and to make their voices heard in government process. And so when we start talking about including diverse perspectives, it's really seeking out those quieter voices. Um, a big part of that is language. You know, if materials aren't available in as many languages as are needed, you're gonna leave out parts of the population. Um, different times of day, different days, different formats, whether it's a phone call or a web survey, an in-person meeting, um, people are gonna be able to access those really differently. Um, and particularly when you work with uh, populations that may be on shift work and have really strict hour schedules. Um, if you hold a meeting during say the second shift, um, no one who ever works the second shift is ever gonna be able to be there. And so making sure that those times are varied and that you can get those voices. Um, a huge one, providing childcare and or transportation. You know, um, obviously what Athena is looking at is transportation to the airport, but transportation for a lot of um, environmental justice affected communities is really a challenge. So if you wanna hold all in-person pers meetings, but people can't get there, um, you're gonna miss out on voices. Um, or if you, you know, if you don't want kids in the room, then provide childcare. Otherwise have kids in the room. It's awesome. I have done more than one resilience plan um, with, with kiddos in the room. Um, and so, uh, you know, be prepared for that. And that's totally, totally fine. Be prepared for some difficult conversations. Um, people might get angry. Um, people might get defensive. People might disagree on pathways forward. Um, but, um, but those conversations are really worth it when it comes to resilience planning. Um, also, I just want to point out the role of models and tools. Um, these can inform decisions. Uh, they can do all sorts of cool things. You can see some of the cool tools we have there. Um, they cannot make decisions for you. They're decision tools to help make decisions, help inform decisions, but often we see people try and relinquish uh, the role of decision making to the tool itself. And when that happens, um, data can only get you so far and it doesn't really get you that stakeholder input. So just one example, and this is my last slide, I know we're about out of time, is this is Los Angeles. Uh, we just finished a huge renewable energy study. If anybody wants links to this, we can definitely give it. Um, and the city has a goal of 100% renewable, um, but in the midst of that, they wanna be resilient. Um, they wanna prioritize certain communities that have air quality issues or may have you know, economic disparities. And so how did we do this? Um, the answer is a lot of time, a lot of money, and a whole lot of engagement. But one of the things we really did was a lot of open public meetings um, hosted by neighbor, neighborhood organizations, uh, the utility, lots of stakeholder engagement, because the goal of this was to be inclusive in the vision, inclusive in the analysis, and to make decisions that benefit everybody, not just a select few. And so I'll, I'll send a link um, to that if people are interested in really diving into how is justice included in this, but this is something that we really prioritize when we look at resilience. Um, and so just a couple of key takeaways. Um, everybody faces risk, um, and the idea behind resilience planning is to reduce that. Uh, it's more than just hardening of systems, but really looking at, looking at that systems perspective, um, considering those future needs as well as current and historical reasons that vulnerability exists in the first place. Um, and then vulnerabilities across the built natural and social environments really should be considered together if you're going to develop true resilient solutions. And so that's it. And I think, Ruth, I'm turning it back to you, I believe. Yes, you are. All right. Very much. I want to thank, why don't we have a round of applause for all of the speakers, even if it's, um, <laughs> if it's on your reaction button. <laughs> so... Um, I do have a couple of questions that people ask as we went along. The first question is for Dr. Horton. When you say on-road vehicles, does that include in moving aircrafts on the ground? No, it does not. No, it's, it's essentially the vehicles that are uh, moving on the, um, you know, the residential and the other roadways, the roadways in the city. So cars, trucks light duty, heavy duty, medium duty vehicles. Is the aircraft are factored separately. They're lumped with the airport. So you really have land side and air side is a, another term that's used in, in transportation and airport planning. Right. And I, we include emissions from uh, the stages of an aircraft operating up to 3,000 feet as well. So those right. are factored in the airport emissions. Great. Um, and Caleb, you somebody asked for bus shuttle optimization, the energy savings is 
for bus only question mark do you have integrated uh, model optimization for an airport on the energy optimization i'm assuming so the, the question is is the that's a 40 percent savings for just the buses yes i think well it says for bus shuttle optimization you talked about that example i would i would call that's that's right yeah so we're not it's not including the airport infrastructure energy savings it's just for the uh energy used to power the buses themselves, which is substantial, I should say. I think Robert can correct me, but I think there's there's a statistic like DFW shuttles drive a, a mileage equivalent to circumnavigating the, the planet. Yeah, Every 18 hours, hours, 18 to 20 yeah. hours. Yeah, 18 to 20 hours. So a 40% savings on that level of uh, energy use is significant. Well, that relates to a question I had, and maybe this is where we can end. How did you decide what aspects of energy operations you were going to focus on in, in Athena? Uh, well, I think uh, <laughs> close collaboration with Robert. So um, unfortunately, it's been quite a while since we've been in the same room. But uh, first uh, year and a half of this project, we spent a lot of time um, at DFW talking to stakeholders uh, and trying to inform this project. So. You know, I mean, we, we made a proposal to, to DOE and, and DFW was a, a partner on that proposal. Um, but then also as we started the project, I think some of our, our views evolved and we changed some of our, our goals to be more responsive to what the airport needed uh, using input from Robert and his team. Um, Robert, did you wanna say anything about that? Yeah, uh, it, so the initial focus was really improving energy in the transportation network, so with the vehicles. Um, but as Caleb mentioned, our insights have evolved based on the work that was done, and we've been able to build on that research each year and discover ne new needs, like the need to transition to uh, uh, electric vehicles in the future or other hybrids and provide resilience. That's uncovering other types of uh, needs in terms of energy systems. And so uh, this has been very beneficial research for the airport. I, I, I had a sort of follow up on the bus optimization, is special attention being devoted towards specific po populations, for instance, aging populations and their, their needs, or how, how are you accommodating human factors into decisions you're making? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So one of the things that, uh, that we really asked um, of the research team is to really put a focus on exactly that perspective because, and how do we measure um, impact uh, to people, right? So understanding the patterns by which people are, are getting around on the airport was a factor in the bus optimization. But I think on the other side, in terms of equity and access to the airport on a broader sense, I think understanding the decision-making that is really incredible work um, to understand what inspires people to choose different modes of transport and how can we democratize it or, uh, so that uh, it's accessible to all sectors of our society. And I'll just add to that to say that, uh, so one of our stakeholders at the airport was customer experience team. Um, and so when when we are looking at you know these solutions, we, we are trying not to just take for granted what the computer supercomputer says we should do um, you know we're trying to always take this through a lens of you know what the impact is for uh, the customer at the at the airport and so with the bus optimization work it was really important to us that we uh, put forward strategies that saved energy but did not sort of unreasonably affect the customer experience um, in our current work looking at infrastructure changes and um, congestion pricing and tools like that, you know, I think that there are also some questions there. And, and this is, you know, a, a larger um, problem that will probably continue past, uh, you know, this year even in, in this work, but, you know, sort of understanding how investments at the airport makes affects different populations differently is, I think, uh, extremely valuable um, and, and sometimes very challenging problem. So I think we're in overtime and I wanna thank all of, there is a meeting for the um, sustainability and resilience group following this, but I uh, wanna thank all of the rest of you for joining us and um, 
We look forward for you to having you participate in future UFTI events. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you.